Thank you so much. All right, so this presentation is going to be a bit different, I think, from what Warren has just delivered. We're going to go a bit more into kind of an analytical focus, and uh, I'm going to give you a very kind of short introduction about network and social networks, and then I'm going to be a bit more focusing on the practicalities of thinking of networks in terms of digital methods and how we can start understanding some of those graphs that we're very familiar with now, like those that you've, you've seen in the examples that Warren provided towards the end of his presentation, or many of the graphs that we see every day in, uh, in uh, you know, journalistic reports sometimes, where networks are very often used to talk about influence or to talk about um, relationships in, uh, in digital objects, but also in other aspects of our everyday life. Okay, so I just wanted to start with something that I really like, which has nothing to do with digital media, social media, um, platforms, politics of platforms. It's something much older, and I always start from here when I talk about social network or where I introduce the idea of social networks also in relation to digital media. So this is called the sociogram, and it's quite old. It was hand-drawn by Jacob Moreno in 1932. So Moreno was a psychiatrist, and we can think of him as the founder of um, psychodrama and psychotherapy using um, game, role games or using theatrical means to try and understand people, people's behavior. Now, what you see there is uh, something that he designed when he was um, asked to try and have a look at a school um, a girls' school in uh, upstate New York, where um, it was a female school, no, it was a school, sorry, not female school, where there had been issues with the pupils. So some of the pupils in the school had run away and there were troubles. It was very difficult to keep the school going, especially with some of the classes. So what they asked him to do was to look at any possible solutions to try and make this group of students work together, group of pupils work together. So what Moreno did was he started to look at how these girls and boys were interacting and what kind of influence they had on one another. So he started tracing these relationships and he started um, kind of mapping how these pupils were behaving in the class and how they were looking at each other and influencing each other. Now, if we look at this sociogram, this, this drawing here, the triangle icons stand for the boys in the group, while the circles are the girls, okay? And when you see a line between any two symbols, you see that there is a, a, a relationship. So a relationship of friendship, a kind of more influential relationship, okay? You will see that some of these lines have an arrow. So the, uh, the, the arrow is indicating the direction of this relationship or the direction of the influence, okay? Um, when I use it, I usually ask people in the classroom uh, or people online to tell me what they see in this sociogram. So if anybody wants to say anything about what you're seeing on this, um, drawing, we can start from there. So what do you think this is telling us? What can you see that might be interesting, intriguing, or strange in this sociogram, if you think of it as mapping relationships in a classroom? Can I speak? Yes, go ahead. I think that the uh, relationship between the boys are more than the girls, so it's like they are too close. Okay, so Amel is saying boys are relating or talking to one another more than the girls. Anything else? Gender-specific friendships, Lindsay is saying. Now, we do you want to say anything? Yes. Um... Um, I, I think what, what also appears in the diagram that there are uh, key actors that are widely inter, uh, interact with, with, with other actors than others. 
So we have like center of inter uh, like center of network in a way if I'm phrasing it correctly. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So we you have identified some of the dynamics. The first thing that I would highlight is that if you we think of this as a group of people, we do see that there are two subgroups coming up as extremely prominent, and these subgroups or clusters are probably defined by gender dynamics. So boys interact with boys and girls interact with girls, okay? And then some of you said maybe boys interact even more. It's possible, uh, I don't know, I haven't counted the lines, but it's possible that the boys group is a bit stronger, a bit more, um, has more cohesion than the girls one. Then another dynamic that we may want to look at is that we have this boy that seems to be kind of adventurous, is the only one linking or bridging to the girls group. So we have this boy talking to this girl on the right side of the network. This is a bridge, it's bridging the two groups and you can start thinking about what this can mean in terms of relationships and in terms of bringing together the classroom, right? Or the groups that we see in the screen. The very last bit that I would look at is the very top where you see that you have two girls who seem to be quite isolated. They have each other, but they are isolated from the girls. And of course they are isolated for the from the boys as well. They are in the corner of the graph. What should we think about? Well, um, there might be issues there. Could they be in trouble? Could they be too isolated? Is this a problem for them, but also for the group overall? So these are some of the things that Moreno, the Moreno was uh, highlighting. Let me just double check what um, we have in the chat. So Salma is saying, are uh, the arrows direction significant? We will see. That's a very good question, Salma. Um, what would do you think? Uh, the diff if we think of the kind of relations that we have online or offline, some of these relations will have a direction. So if you think of influence, we also we, we have someone influencing someone else. And this is very important because it tells us about power as well, okay? In this case, these, these have an arrow, so it, they are about influence, so people influencing others. So uh, this is important in terms of power. When a relationship is reciprocal and the same level, um, there's no direction, then we have different types of dynamics that we can study, okay? I think there was another question. What would be interesting is the length and type of interaction. Maybe the girls interact for longer, so less interactions. You can tell from this observation. No, wow, Lindsay, this is very interesting. You know, um, here's the theory of the strength of the ties in the relationship that comes from other sociologists. And this is exactly about thinking about the intensity of a relationship in a network, okay? The sociogram here is not mapping the weight of these relationships, but people have been studying strong ties and weak ties or strong relationships and weak relationships and how these may be important in terms of social capital, okay? So there is a very interesting piece about the strength of weak ties. I think it was Granovetter. Now I don't want to mix up, you know, the, the gota of the sociology, but I think it was Granovetter, the strength of weak ties looking at differences in how intense a relationship or a tie can be. So it is not in this social gram Lindsay, but it's a very important point. Okay. Some is also saying it also raises questions about who is making these assessments, self-reported or researchers' observations. Definitely you're you're going way beyond what I wanted to to talk about. But yes, of course it's also very important to think about who is mapping these relationships. And if they are self-reported, so coming from interviews or coming from an observation that a researcher is doing. Okay, so positionality and reflection is also very important here. But going a bit beyond what I wanted to say. Okay, so this is the kind of beginning of, of when we think of networks and we try to visualize these networks in a way that they can tell us something about relationships in a group and relations. So very briefly, why we may want to use, look at networks and maybe try to use social network analysis. Sociograms are a form of social network analysis. 
there are thousands of applications, both in quantitative dynamics, quantitative terms and qualitative terms, okay? But let's just think about why we may want to look at networks. The idea is that by looking at, now the first idea is that there is an implicit structure in any group, okay? In any group of our entities, there will be some sort of structure. And the idea is that it is important to look at this structure because that can help us understanding behavior and can help us understanding uh, more than we could understand by just looking at specific attributes of any of the entities in the group, okay? So it's about thinking of the importance of structural relations and how they may affect the entities of a group or the individuals in a group, okay? start thinking about social media and what we're talking about, okay? Start, start thinking about what I'm saying now can be applied to a study of social media dynamic, how users interact on a platform, but also how hashtags are used in a platform and in a platform that has itself some influence on how an hashtag become visible, okay? Um, so the idea is that social networks. So when we look at networks of our social networks of people interacting together, these networks may have an impact on perceptions, beliefs and actions. Okay. And another very important point that sometimes you forget is network are transient. So they are just a snapshot in time while relations keep changing or keep evolving. So we need to think whenever we produce a graph, a sociogram or a, a graph of a social network um, group, we need to think of it as something that is very fixed in time. So it represents what's happening in a specific moment, but it will change over time. So we need to be very, very conscious of what we are representing and what we are saying about this graph that we are showing or this network that we are trying to map, okay? So if you, want to want, if you want to know more about these things and also a bit more about the theory of social network analysis, this is a resource that you can look at, okay? Now, we don't really have time to um, talk more about the conceptual underpinning or um, the theoretical frameworks of social network analysis because they want, we also want to give you a bit more of a practical of a set of practical tools that you can use to develop digital methods. So I'm just going to give you a few um, bits of terminology when we use social networks analysis or visual network analysis for digital methods, okay? And we will start from the easy stuff, which is the elements of a graph in, in a network. And we're using the terminology that is most common in the domain of social sciences, okay? Network has also studies in, in studied in other disciplines, but the kind of terminology that I'm using here is the one that is most common in, in the social sciences, okay? So when we have a graph or like a sociogram, we have usually uh, the symbol, usually circles, but they could be also a different shape and the stands for the entities. And then, Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, and then those are called nodes, okay? So the circles here or the triangles or the circles in Moreno's graph, social graphs, are the nodes of the network. The lines uh, that represent the relationship, the relationship between any two entities or any two nodes are called edges, okay? So this is the very starting point. Now I'm gonna talk about different types of network. There are many more, but for now and for today, we're only focusing on directed and undirected networks. And you will see that this links back to what uh, some of you were was asking earlier about the arrow and the direction of the relationship. So in directed networks, we do have an arrow in the, in the edge. So, um, Basically, there is a direction in the relationship, and we can say that this is mapping a one-way relationship. So a relationship that goes from one node to another, okay? In this case, we have a source node that is sending an arrow, is sending a, a relationship towards a target node, okay? Sources and targets. 
So let's start thinking about uh, it in terms of social networks and uh, social media. Okay. So if we look at, for instance, a Facebook group, um, which is which are actually quite common as a thing on Facebook on the platform. If we think of the act of commenting, so someone commenting on someone else's content or commenting on someone else's post in the group space, this is a directed relationship. Okay, we have someone, an entity, so a target node commenting on, uh, sorry, a source node commenting on a target node. Okay, so we have the two nodes that you see at the bottom of the, of the slides and one is um, an account, a user commenting on another user's content. Okay, so this is a relationship that we can map using social network analysis and visualize using visual network analysis. And in this graph that you see here, the network that we have built is a commenting network. So someone, people commenting on other people, and we are tracing these relationships with the edges that represent the comments. Okay. We can think of it, um, we can think of directing networks on in the Twitter domain as well. This is a retweet network. So the graph that you see there comes from a study of mine and is basically mapping um, accounts, retweeting other accounts. Okay, so here, as you see at the bottom of the, of the slide, we have Twitter account retweeting other Twitter account, and overall the network is showing the, um, the network that is coming up with this retweeting dynamics. Okay. Now, we also have networks, as I mentioned earlier, where you don't really have a direction. You are mapping relationships that don't have a specific direction. So they are reciprocal relationships. They are two-way relationships. So in this case, in our graph, uh, the edges will not have an arrow, OK? These are, I would say, the slightly less common in uh, social media research, but you can still use them, and one way um, you can think of them is, for instance, in co-hashtag networks, so basically studies but where people are looking at how hashtags are used together. For instance, if I build a data set of tweets where people talk about a specific issue, um, in my data set I may want to study how hashtags are used together to talk about that issue, okay, because by looking at co-hashtags, so hashtag, co-hashtag networks, I may see if I can identify specific themes marked by hashtags that emerge in the conversation about that specific issue, okay? So in this case, the two nodes, as you see at the bottom of the slide, the two nodes will be hashtags. And the edge, so the relationship that I'm trying to map is when these hashtags are used together, okay? So the very last bit is about network measures. There are many more network measures than you see on these slides, but I think these are among the most common ones in digital methods research. And very often we don't even name them. We just kind of take these graphs for granted and we understand what they mean without knowing really what kind of measure is going behind it. So I always like giving, giving a little bit of time um, to try and understand what we see in these networks so or in these beautiful, colorful graphs that were always uh, given in social media research. We will start from the very easiest, probably from the easiest one, the degree centrality measures. And you can also think of search engines and the way they work, for instance, Google, um, they are based on uh, degree centrality measures. The page rank algorithm works with the idea of mapping, of suggesting and prioritizing websites that have a high degree centrality. And now we'll see how this works. So um, a node's degree centrality is counting the total number of edges touching a node. So the total number of times that specific entity is involved in a relationship. 
So if we look at this very simple network, we can see that different nodes have different degree centrality, okay? So if I ask you which one of these nodes have the highest degree centrality, which one would you say it is? So the node that has highest centrality, Dala is saying B. So the definition is degree centrality indicates the total number of edges touching a node. Total number of edges touching a node. Who do you think is the one with highest? A. It is A, but Dalal, I know what you mean, and you see it in a second. So in this case, it's A because A is the node where you see more a highest number of edges going out of it or coming in in total. We don't look at the arrow; we just look at the edges. Okay. So A is the one with the highest. Okay. Now we can see that. And I think we're going back to what Dalla was saying. We can see that actually we can think of centrality in a slightly more nuanced way. Okay. So in degree centrality is indicating and counting the number of directed edges that a node is receiving. Okay. So how often a node is a target of an edge. So how often it's acting as a target node. Okay. And the out degree is the opposite. So we have a directed network, a network with arrows, with edges that have, have arrows. And we're looking at <clears throat> our degree centrality. So we're looking at the nodes that are sending out edges and we're counting how many they're sending out. So if we're looking back at the same graph that we were looking at before, which one do you think is the one with the highest in degree centrality? Remember, in degree is the number of edges that a node is receiving. It's B, so Della was right. <laughs> yes, okay. So, yes. So, if we look at it in terms of out degree, which one is the one with the highest out degree? So, the one that is sending out is A, okay? So, simple stuff, very simple stuff in a way, once you know it. But uh, this is what is usually, these are the measures that are usually used to visualize networks. Some of those very colorful, colorful networks that Warren was showing you earlier in those examples actually play around these, these uh, measures to visualize nodes and influence. The very last one is modularity, which is a more recent Kind of measure it was introduced by newman which is an, ama an amazing amazing academic he's not a social, social scientist i think he's a physicist but if you try and have a go at listening to some of his talks um they're pretty amazing the way he talks about networks in different domains is very accessible and i have it in the references if you want to watch um one of the videos with his lectures anyway uh, he introduced the idea of modularity and uh, modularity is a way to measure the forming of clusters within a network, so the forming of subgroups within a network. So if we think back of Moreno's sociograms, we had two subgroups which came out as, as very evident in some of the graphs that we could see in Warren's example. Again, we saw some of these subgroups. So modularity is looking for cliques or clusters highly cohesive subgroups within a network because that tells us something, for instance, in terms of echo chambers, filter bubbles, uh, polarization, if we look at conversation on, on a social media platform about the specific topic, it helps us identify how, uh, for instance, users seems to congregate in groups and then start thinking about why they are clicking in those specific groups. Okay, we can also use modularity not to, to look at users, but to look at how meaning is produced in a conversation online. So if we go back to the idea of hashtags and co-hashtag networks, um, we can try and see how hashtags, uh, the use of hashtags in, in a conversation about a specific issues seems to clusterize in specific thematic groups, okay? And specific themes that form around hashtags being used together, okay? So 
often modularity is represented this way. So you, you have these subgroups that are visualized with their nodes being uh, colored with different colors. Okay. And now just to close this, this part, I wanted to give you a couple of examples of how these, uh, these things are used in practice to give you a more, more sense of how, uh, a better sense of how this can be used. So in degree centrality, as Della, I think, was already thinking about, is often used to measure influence, okay? Influence or popularity. All the work about influencers is now called more about creators, but all the kind of network work about the impact of influencers, or sometimes called gatekeepers in social media research, uses some sort of in degree centrality measuring to map influence. So this is um, a little experiment that I did with some of my students who were looking at the Facebook group about Stranger Things. You might be familiar with it. It's a Netflix series about uh, science fiction and uh, about set in the 80s, kind of intriguing. Anyway, there is a fun club, of course, uh, you know, numerous fun clubs about Stranger Things on Facebook. We looked at a public group on Facebook and uh, we mapped um, the relationships between um, among the users. And what you see there, the red nodes are actually posts in, in, uh, in the group, um, in the group space. And the blue nodes are the um, users commenting. Okay, so the edges are mapping um, comments, engagement, so different forms of engagement with this post. So the bigger the, the node, the red node that you see there, the highest, the in degree centrality of that uh, node, which means that the most often that post has been engaged with. Okay, so being commented or liked or engaged with. So this is measuring engagement and which posts have become most popular within the group. Okay. So you start seeing also how digital methods are using those metrics that are very much the metrics used by platforms to make profit, but also to direct the way we use them. So we go back to the idea of digital methods exploiting the same kind of digital objects that platform use to um, in their design. Okay. In the context of Twitter, um, this is a study, a retweet network, where I was studying a specific conversation on Twitter about a health condition. And I wanted to see which accounts were most frequently retweeted. So which account became most popular and kind of gatekeepers of the conversation. And um, I wanted to see if it would be, uh, if it was, you know, traditional media outlet or individual users or patients and that. Uh, with uh, the in-degree uh, centrality measure, I could visualize it clearly by giving, you know, measuring the size of the nodes based on their uh, in-degree centrality. And you see the Time magazine is coming up as extremely prominent here, but then we have also a few other entities being retweeted a lot, so becoming prominent and influential. Modularity, as I said, is, is used to map clustering or clicking in a, in a network. And um, so this is the same Stranger Things kind of network. And uh, the modularity here is used to color the different communities or clusters forming in this network uh, based on how people were uh, commenting and engaging with, con with content. And you can see, we can see emerging communities around specific posts. And this is slightly different. Um, this comes from Tumblr and Tumblr tool is a software that you can use to um, extract data from Tumblr, which is a blog, basically a, a blog service, a blog uh, platform. Um, with Tumblr tool, you can also extract hashtag networks used to you know, talk about a specific issue. And here again, I was looking at the same health condition that I was using earlier. So I extracted the hashtags used to talk about that condition and, and the, the relationship here maps co-hashtagging, so the, the use of hashtags together. And then if you apply a modularity measure here, it allows you to identify 
um, clusters of hashtags used very frequently used together. And in this way, that allowed me to see how these health conditions was sometimes stopped in the green side, it was stopped in terms of users' experience of these conditions, uh, with a lot of memoirs being uh, hashtagged, tagged, or a lot of personal telling of the condition, or uh, in the in the green in the blue side, you have a totally different way to talk about the same condition. So in this case, modularity is helping us understanding how meaning is produced around a specific topic. And I'm not going to do it now, but if you want to know more about this, there is Mark Owen Jones is a colleague who is very good at sharing quick research that he has done with digital methods technique, looking at contemporary issues. And here there is a Twitter thread that you can find on the slide and you can have a look at it where he explained how he built this network and how um, what he could learn by mapping these dynamics on Twitter. And this is about um, COVID-19 um, policies. Okay. So these are the resources that I used on this presentation and a few more um, sources of information that can be useful to start with the idea of social networks. Okay.